What's going on everybody? This is Anti here with Player One Gaming and I am very excited about today's video because today we are going over one of my favorite multi-class combos in Dungeons and Dragons and that's the Gloom Stalker Assassin. This is a super stealthy ranged fighter that can deal an insane amount of damage, especially in the first round of combat where once you get up to level 12, you're going to be able to attack up to five or even six times in a single round of combat. This build is one part ranger, one part rogue, and just a pinch of fighter at the end for a little added spice. But this is a notorious build from D&D 5e that is known for being a little OP, but a whole lot of fun. So much so that when I was getting ready for the game to launch, I had my list of classes that I was interested in doing some of my first playthroughs with, uh, but as much as I like rangers and rogues, they weren't really on my radar as far as options for a first playthrough. That was until Larian announced the inclusion of the Gloomstalker, a game-changing subclass for the ranger. I had so much fun with this build, Larian gave me exactly what I wanted to build the exact character I wanted, even down to the magic items and the fashion. As you can see here with the stealthy looking black hood and half mask, that classic assassin look, I love it. And every one of these items that's equipped serves a purpose for making this character not only look badass, but be badass. And we'll talk about these items towards the end of the video and I'll let you know where I picked them up at. One more thing before we dive in, let me just say this. I'm going to be doing a whole series of videos on some of the best multi-class builds in the game. These are going to be very detailed build guides. So if you're interested in seeing more of these, just remember to hit that subscribe button to be notified in the future of when those drop. But as I said, these are going to be very detailed where I just show you what I feel is the best options for these builds. You're of course free to deviate from any of these options at any time. I'm just going to be showing you what I feel is the optimal choice. However, if you're watching and feel like I missed out on a particular option that would be good for this build, please feel free to let me know in the comments below. But okay, let's dive into the nitty gritty. Okay, so the first thing we're going to pick is race. And for race, we're going to go with the elf. The elf gets elven weapon training, but we don't really need that because we get all those proficiencies from being a ranger. Uh, we get 40 feet of dark vision, which is certainly helpful in the early game. However, as soon as we pick Gloomstalker at level three, we are actually gonna get 80 feet of dark vision. But either way, we're gonna need dark vision in this game, especially as a ranged attacker. You're gonna wanna be able to see very far in the dark, see your target from across the map. And we also get Fey Ancestry, which uh, gives you advantage on saving throws against being charmed and magic can't put you to sleep. So kind of situational, but helpful nonetheless. When you do need it, you're going to be glad you had it. So for subrace, we're going to go with Wood Elf. Uh, Wood Elf gets Fleet of Foot. It gives you an extra 5 movement speed. So this is going to be very helpful for ranged attackers that are going to want to get in good spots, get high ground as early as possible. That extra 5 movement feet is going to go a long way. Also, it's not listed right here, but as you can see over here, we get proficiency in stealth. And this is a stealth build, so obviously we are going to want that. We're going to want to get that stealth skill as high as possible. Also at first level we get the Natural Explorer ability. It says years of traveling in the wild have made you particularly attuned to beasts or adept at surviving in certain environments. So for this I recommend picking up Beast Tamer. You may look at Urban Tracker and think thematically this is a better choice, and that may be true. But from a game mechanics perspective, Urban Tracker, which just gives you proficiency in sleight of hand, is really kind of useless. Um, we're going to get sleight of hand a different way. Don't worry, you will have proficiency in sleight of hand. But I think by going with Beast Tamer, you get something a lot more useful, and that is the Find Familiar spell. First off, uh, you're not going to have a lot of those classic ranger abilities, just because it's not that kind of character. But I do like to have a little taste of the ranger class and find familiar gives you a little animal companion to have with you. Me personally, I went with the raven. I think not only does it fit the gloom stalker very much thematically, but also I just believe that the raven is the best familiar option available in the game. It allows you to blind your opponents, which is which can be hugely useful, especially for this build. And I will touch on that later. But I think this is a no brainer. 
you go with the beast tamer here get the find familiar spell and then we will move on to favored enemy now favored enemy says studying the tactics and abilities of certain creatures has granted you a set of abilities that is useful in a variety of situations now this is another situation where the first one on the list is the clear choice to go with bounty hunter ranger knight is also pretty cool um it gives you proficiency in heavy armor if you're going with a different kind of ranger build this is i suppose something you could consider it's another good option However, it's absolutely not what we're going for with this build. It's actually the opposite of what we're going for. You don't want to put a stealth character like this in heavy armor. Um, Bounty Hunter is perfect, though. It's going to give you proficiency in investigation checks, which you'll do pretty often, and will also help mitigate the low intelligence score that you're certainly going to have. So that's good, but the real reason we're taking it here is... It takes a decent spell that you're likely already going to have and makes it much better. It says that when you use Ensnaring Strike, your target will have disadvantage on their saving throw to get out of it. So that's really good. So I think Bounty Hunter is the clear winner here. We're going to go ahead and pick that. And then we're on to Background. Okay, so Background. There's a few different options you could pick that fit thematically, but what I'm going to recommend is that you go with Charlatan because Charlatan gives you that sleight of hand proficiency. And even though a couple other backgrounds do that, like criminal and urchin, those backgrounds give you stealth as well, which you already have. You have that skill from your race. So I recommend Charlatan because you get that sleight of hand proficiency, but then you also get deception. Now your charisma is not going to be high as a gloom stalker. So having proficiency in deception is going to help mitigate that and give you a go-to ability to use during social interactions. Okay, now on to perhaps one of the more important parts of building a character, and that's the ability scores. Um, your primary ability score is Dexterity. This is because you're building an archer. You're gonna be using a bow as your primary method of attacking. So that means you're gonna be using your Dexterity modifier. So you're going to put the plus two bonus into that. You are going to max the score out at 17. And then you're going to go to your secondary ability score, which is Wisdom. Wisdom is your secondary ability score because it is the modifier for your spellcasting ability. Rangers are half casters, so you will get a few spells and Wisdom will be the modifier for those spells. So you're going to use your plus one bonus for Wisdom and then you're also going to be looking at maxing this out at 16. So you're going to have to bring one of these other ability scores down. Constitution is going to be your other more important ability score that you want to have a decent number in. I actually recommend bringing down Charisma. You're going to use Wisdom as your primary mental ability score. So you can lack in both Intelligence and Charisma. You don't have to dump it all the way down to 8. I did. It's a little bit of min-maxing going on, I know. But honestly, this video is about building an optimal character, and I believe that this is the optimal way to do it, to lean into your strengths and be okay with those weaknesses. Also, if you don't mind metagaming, uh, we of course have the warped headband of intellect that we can get very early on in the game to bring that intelligence up to 17. I didn't wear that through the whole game, but I did always have it in my back pocket just in case. So I bring down intelligence and charisma. I dump both of them. I'm going to lean on my other party members or magic items, as I mentioned, for those stats. And then I'd really like to get constitution up to 14. So that's why we're dumping both of those. And we're going to have to bring strength down a little bit too. Now, it's a very common option to dump strength instead. I should mention that. And when I play D&D 5e, the tabletop version, if I was building a dexterity-based character, I would probably dump strength. However, in BG3... Strength is really important because of the shove mechanic in this game. I like having at least a decent strength score. For situations where I have to shove enemies either away from me or off a high ledge. So that's why I'm choosing to dump charisma as opposed to strength. I probably would do the opposite if I was building a character for 5e. But for BG3, yep, we're going to dump intelligence, charisma, and we're going to bring this strength down to an average strength at 10 giving us a neutral modifier of zero. And that's gonna allow us to bring the constitution up to 14. Okay, real quick with the skills, we have proficiency in the sleight of hand and the stealth from our background and our race. So that is good, we've got that covered. That's a big part of this build because you are gonna be a ranger rogue. You are gonna fit that 
rogue class even before you begin to take levels of rogue. So you're going to want to make sure that you have proficiency in both of these skills. Now, even though they gave you your chosen proficiencies here in nature and animal handling, I'm going to have to recommend against it. Again, we are not building a classic ranger character here. I think you'd be much better off putting your skills in athletics and insight here. And I think it makes sense. As an assassin, you would want to be athletic and you would want to have good insight. And not only that, from a game mechanics perspective, both of these skills are used very often. So you're going to be better off choosing those two skills. And that's going to give you a pretty well-rounded character. Okay, level two. This is when we get spells. So as I mentioned, rangers are half casters. You're not gonna get above a second level spell slot in this game, and you're not gonna have a lot of spells available to you, but you will get some. And at first level, even though you don't have a ton of spells to choose from, you have some really good ones. A few of these made my best first level spells of the game list. I'll put a link for that video below if you'd like to check it out. But yeah, the ranger gets the choice of a few really good spells at first level. And you're going to have to make a tough choice when deciding which one to pick. Though I will say an absolute must pick here is Hunter's Mark. As a bonus action, you mark a target. And every time you attack that target, it deals out an additional 1d6 damage. Every time you attack it. When you start getting extra attack and start being able to attack 4, 5, or even 6 times in the higher levels of play, that's a ton of extra damage that you're dealing in that one round of combat and on top of that after you kill your mark you can apply hunter's mark to a new target without expending a spell slot so fantastic spell it's a must pick for this build but for our second slot that's when things get a little tougher ensnaring strike fog cloud and enhanced leap are all viable choices those are the three that we're really going to be looking at and we're only going to be able to pick two of them Hunter's Mark plus one more now, plus another one when we level up again. But for now, I think you should take Ensnaring Strike. So the description for Ensnaring Strike is your attack summons thorny vines that possibly ensnare your target. Now ensnared creatures take 1d6 damage at the start of each turn, upon which that creature can use a strength save to try and escape from the vines. And this is why we're taking this, because if you remember your bounty hunter ability that you took at first level, that gave you a buff to this, which is going to allow you to impose disadvantage on this strength save for the spell. So you're kind of backing up your investment here by making sure that you take ensnaring strike. It also just makes a pretty good spell that much better. Another good one is Enhanced Leap. This is going to triple your jumping distance. Very good for this character build because there are going to be times where you're going to want to ensure that you can get high ground right away at the start of combat. So Enhanced Leap is definitely a good one to take. Fog Cloud is also pretty great for stealth, but we're going to start off by taking Hunter's Mark and Ensnaring Strike. All right, so here we pick up the Ranger fighting style. While there's definitely a few good options here, the choice for us is clear. We're building an archer, so we're going to take archery. This gives us a plus two bonus to our attack rolls. So that's pretty awesome. That's going to go a long way in getting us that high DPS that we are looking at getting with this build. Okay, that's it for level two. Moving on to level three. And the most exciting thing about level three, the subclasses. Now, while all these subclasses are pretty good, Beastmaster, I think, is pretty great. If that's the ranger you want to build, awesome. But we are here for the Gloomstalker. It says, emerging like a horrible gift from the envelope of darkness and shadow, you ambush and put down your foes before they can even scream. Um, yeah, pretty cool. And what else is cool are these subclass features. Let's take a look. We have Dread Ambusher. I would say without a doubt, the best feature that you get from the Gloomstalker. It does three different things. Dread Ambusher says you specialize in taking out your foes swiftly and ruthlessly. You gain a plus three bonus to initiative. I've already done my playthrough with this character, and I think there was maybe two combat encounters where I didn't go first. I'm serious. You are going to act first on just about every combat encounter in the entire game. So that's just one thing it does. The second thing it does is increase your movement speed on the first turn of combat by 10 feet. So you already have an extra 5 feet of movement. 
all the time. So on your first turn, you're going to have an extra 15 feet of movement. Compared to the other races in the game who start with 5 or even 10 feet less movement than the Wood Elf. And that's not all. There's a third feature to Dread Ambusher, which is arguably the best part about it. And that is that on the first turn of combat, you can make an attack, like another attack on top of the one that you already make, that deals an additional 1d8 of damage on top of the damage that you're already doing. This is so powerful. Plus three bonus in initiative, and in the first turn of combat, you move an extra 10 feet and make an extra attack for an additional 1d8 of damage. Yeah, Dread Ambusher is one of the main reasons we're showing up here. And it is something you are going to use from level three all the way up to level 12 in literally every combat encounter in the game. So talk about getting mileage from an ability doesn't get much better than that. Okay, we also pick up superior dark vision. This gives us dark vision out to 80 feet, essentially doubling what we already had. Then there's dread ambusher, which allows you to hide as a bonus action. This is extremely useful, not only to hide from your opponents, but this is a very good way to get advantage. You're gonna be using this all the time to set up sharpshooter and to set up sneak attack. Another great ability though is umbral shroud. Umbral Shroud says wrap yourself in shadows to become invisible if you are obscured. So what it does is allows you to turn invisible for up to 10 turns so long as you are in dim light or darkness. Now I probably don't need to tell you how handy this ability is going to be, especially for this build as remaining stealthy and unseen is so important. Okay lastly we also get the disguise self spell with the Gloomstalker. So this is pretty cool, it's not something that you're going to be using all of the time. But you can get creative and have a little fun with this spell, and it can actually be very useful in the right situations. Okay, we go back to choose one more first level spell here. As mentioned, there's lots of good options, but in my opinion, it's really between Enhanced Leap and Fog Cloud. And in this case, for this build, I gotta go with Enhanced Leap. The three times jumping distance will go a long way in helping you to get high ground. Fog Cloud's great too, it's great for stealth, but it can be picked up by your party spellcaster and cast by them, so anyone in the group can use it. Also, side note about the animal spells here, I don't recommend them. Animal friendship um, is very niche. I don't feel like you would use it enough to justify taking it. And Speak with Animals is useful and also very entertaining in this game. However, the Speak with Animals potions are widely available and super cheap. You can buy them from the merchants and always have one on hand when you want it. So I don't recommend wasting a precious spell slot on either one of those. You also might see Hail of Thorns here and be interested in taking that. But honestly, it's a pretty underwhelming spell. It's not as good as it looks on paper. And there's also some gloves you can get pretty early on in the game that give you this spell. And I'll touch on those a little bit later in the video. But at the end of the day, we can only pick one spell here. So that being said, my recommendation is to go with Enhanced Leap. Okay, on to level four. Level four is a big one because we get to pick a feat or take an ability score improvement. And for this build, we are actually going to only do feats. We're gonna do one full feat and one half feat. A half feat is one that allows you to get a plus one bonus in a particular ability score, as well as still get some other Nice ability that's usually not quite as good as a full feat, but it's still an additional ability nonetheless. Now, similar to many of the multi-class builds, we are only going to have the opportunity to take two feats as opposed to three. That is a big part of the opportunity cost of multi-classing. Uh, we have to give up a little something to get something in return. And in this case, the returns pay dividends. So we don't have to worry about that too much. The biggest downside to it, however, is that we won't be able to get the dexterity skill up to 20, which is unfortunate. We are going to cap it at 18. So that is going to give us a plus four modifier as opposed to a plus five modifier. But again, the trade-off is worth it. And the trade-off in this case is sharpshooter. This is one of the best feats in the game, along with Great Weapon Master, which is kind of like the melee version of this. But Sharpshooter, basically what it does is it's a feature that you can toggle on and off. And when you want to use it, it gives you a minus five penalty on your attack roll. But in return, you get a plus 10 bonus to the damage that you deal. That is significant. And once you learn how to use this, 
particularly in this build, there are a lot of things that work synergistically in this build to help give you things like advantage, which offsets this minus five penalty that you get. So trust me on this one, uh, you are gonna take two feats as opposed to any ability score improvements, and those two feats are going to be Sharpshooter and Athlete. Now what Athlete is, it's a half feat, as I mentioned, and it allows you to increase your strength or dexterity by one. In our case, of course, it'll be dexterity. And then it also gives you this additional ability where, where if you fall prone, standing up uses less of your movement allowance and also your jump distance increases by 50%. Now, admittingly, when I did this Gloomstalker build in my own playthrough, I was very impatient because I was very excited to get Sharpshooter and I ended up taking Sharpshooter first. If you're feeling the same, you are more than welcome to do that. It certainly wouldn't be a mistake. However, in hindsight for me, I do believe that the better option is to take Athlete first get that dexterity up a point, which will bring your modifier up to plus four. And the biggest reason I'm making this a priority is because it's not actually until we get to level eight that we take our rogue subclass, which will be assassin. And when we take assassin, it gives us some really awesome abilities that, that help give us advantage to negate that minus five penalty. And that's really when we get to see sharpshooter in its full glory. So again, you're not going to make a huge mistake if you really want to take Sharpshooter first and then Athlete second. Whichever you decide, though, you're going to have a ton of fun either way. Okay, level 5. Level 5 is a big one for all the martial classes because they get extra attack. What this means is every time you make an attack, you can get one extra attack on top of it. So the extra attack is a big feature. It's really the whole reason we stay at Ranger for five levels instead of four. And additionally, we pick up Misty Step, one of the best spells in the game. Misty Step is amazing. What it does is allow you to teleport from one side of the map to the other as a bonus action. This is such a powerful ability and one that you'll likely use in just about every combat encounter. Misty Step is so good that I've made it a point to get it for all of my party members, not just my PC and my spellcasters. I'm actually gonna be releasing a video within the next week or so detailing all the different ways that you can pick up Misty Step in this game, so be on the lookout for that. So yeah, extra attack, Misty Step, all very awesome, and of course, level two spells. So there's some decent spells here. Nothing like the selection you had at level one. I think there was a lot to choose from there. In this case, I think it's pretty clear cut. For this particular build, I think you should be taking Pass Without Trace. What this spell does is it gives you a plus 10 bonus to your stealth checks for you and all of your companions. And why this is so important is, honestly, it can be frustrating if you have a very stealthy character and you've got some companion behind you in heavy armor clunking around making all sorts of noise. So yeah, that's why we bring in Pass Without Trace. You cast it and it remains active until a long rest, so long as you can maintain your concentration on it. And it's a very helpful spell to have for this build. All right, so that'll be it for level five and that'll be it for Ranger. We move on to level six and this is where the actual multi-class begins. We take our first level of Rogue and it is a good one. Rogue is a very front-loaded class. The first few levels get quite a bit. First level, we got Sneak Attack here. I mean, Sneak Attack is the Rogue's primary ability. You can't talk about Rogue without talking about Sneak Attack. It is their bread and butter. And so it's pretty awesome you get it right away, right off the bat at first level. And for those of you who don't know what Sneak Attack is, is it allows you to deal extra damage to your target so long as you either have advantage against it or if you have an ally standing within melee range of that target. And you must not have a disadvantage. Now with this particular build, there's going to be several different ways that we can get advantage. It's going to allow us to use the aforementioned Sharpshooter feat as well as the Sneak Attack pretty often. But for now, with our one level of Rogue, this is a very welcome feature. And there's one more thing that we get. Rogues are known as a bit of a skill monkey, kind of a jack of all trades, which allows us to pick uh, two skills to apply expertise in. And expertise is going to double our proficiency bonus in any one of these skills. Now, all of the skills that we have already that we are already proficient in are all handy skills to have. But as I mentioned earlier in this video, stealth and sleight of hand, are going to be our priorities. We are an assassin that is going to be dealing crazy damage, while also taking care of rogue-like tasks like lockpicking and disarming traps. 
So we are going to apply that expertise in both sleight of hand and in stealth. It's gonna bring those scores up to plus eight and allow us to pretty much be able to pick any lock and disarm any trap that we want. And if you wanna get really bold, even pick some pockets while you're at it. Okay, so the good times keep rolling at level seven, takes us to level two rogue, where we get the cunning action abilities. This allows us to hide, dash, and disengage all for a bonus action as opposed to an action. Aside from sneak attack, this is probably the other main rogue ability. Now, because we are a gloom stalker, we were already able to hide as a bonus action. So we're kind of unnecessarily double dipping there, but being able to dash and disengage as a bonus action is also great abilities. We already have a ton of movement speed, so if we ever want to apply dash in one of the rounds, we are going to basically be able to get anywhere on the map. And disengage is also very useful. There's going to be situations sometimes where you can't help it. You might find yourself surrounded, and that's when disengage comes in very handy. Okay, level 8, which brings us to level 3 rogue, which you know what that means. It is subclass time. So as mentioned already, we are taking the Assassin subclass. And with the Assassin comes the Assassinate abilities. There's a few of them, and these are build-defining abilities. Along with the Gloomstalker ones that we get at level 3, these are huge. So first off, there's the Initiative ability. It says you are the deadliest against unprepared enemies. In combat, you have advantage on attack rolls against creatures that haven't taken a turn yet. So you remember when I was talking about getting advantage to help set up sneak attack and help mitigate the penalty that sharpshooter imposes? This is what I was talking about. And if you also recall, you have a plus three bonus to initiative and you are pretty much gonna be going first in every round of combat. So what that means is you get to use this in every combat encounter. For that first round, you are pretty much always going to be able to use Sneak Attack and always going to be able to use Sharpshooter. But it doesn't stop there. Our next Assassinate ability is Ambush, and it says any successful attack roll against a surprise creature is a critical hit. Again, this is a feature that works very well with the things that we've already picked up. You are extremely stealthy. You're going to be sneaking around, ambushing your opponents a lot of the time, which creates this surprised condition on them and allows you to be able to turn those initial attacks on them, which are already powerhouses, into crits. So yeah, I mean, if you remember earlier in the beginning of the video when I was talking about how much insane damage this build can do, this is really where that truly begins. But wait, we're still not done. There's still one more, and that's Assassin's Alacrity. The description says, Quick as an alley cat in a rain dark city, you immediately restore your action and bonus action at the start of combat. So guys, once again, we have a really awesome ability that works perfectly with another really awesome ability we already have. Because here's the thing, when you ambush someone, when you make an attack on a creature that wasn't expecting it, you initiate combat and in doing so, that was your action. You've now burned your action. You are not gonna get that back unless you're a rogue assassin because what this does is immediately restores your action and bonus action at the start of combat so already with all of the abilities that we have we are able to quietly and stealthily approach our opponent ambush them so we get a free attack in so that's one attack we then get our action back as soon as combat begins in which we're almost certainly first to act in we can then make another attack with advantage so we can use sneak attack and sharpshooter if you already have it. So that's our second attack. We also have extra attack. So we use that to make a third attack. Oh, and guess what? We still have dread ambusher, so we can use that to make a fourth attack. Now it's only gonna get better as we continue to level up, but here at level eight, we are now able to make as many as four attacks or if you have some other things working for you or maybe you drank a potion of speed, you can do even more than that. But by default, in the first round of combat, at this point, you will be making three, or if you made an ambush, even four attacks to start off the combat encounter. And that'll be level eight. So moving on to level nine, we are now at level four rogue, and you know what that means. That means we get to pick our other feet. So whichever one you didn't pick the first time, you're gonna pick this time. So at this point, you should have your dexterity up to 18 with athlete and have the sharpshooter feet as well. 
All right, level 10 this is our last level of rogue. This is an easy one. We don't really have to pick anything. We just get one thing, but that one thing is pretty strong. It's called uncanny dodge. The description is use your lightning quick reflexes to protect yourself. When an attack hits you, you only take half the usual damage. So this is a fantastic ability. Um, this is a toggle on and off ability for some reason. I'm not quite sure why it's just not a passive ability that's always active, but I actually played several sessions where I had this toggled off at first and didn't even realize it. I just assumed it was automatically always on. It certainly should be, but just wanted to mention that to you so you can make sure that you check your passives tab. Make sure that this is turned on immediately because you definitely want to make use of this awesome feature. Okay, so that is the Gloomstalker Assassin, but we are not done yet. We still have two more levels. And this is when we bring in that cherry on top that I mentioned, the fighter. We are going to be doing a two level dip in fighter. It's pretty straightforward. There isn't a whole lot of things to pick. At first level of fighter, we get two things. We get second wind, which allows you to heal yourself as a bonus action. This is a great ability if you are just playing a fighter or if you're picking this up a little bit earlier on in the game. Trouble is this late in the game, 1d10 plus one of healing isn't much. However, I will take it. I mean, it's a bonus action. It allows you to top off your health. I'm just saying later in the game, it's a little less useful than it is earlier on. And out of the three things that we get from taking a fighter, this is the least impactful one at this point. But the next one's pretty awesome. We get to pick up an additional fighting style. And the choice is pretty clear as most of these don't pertain to us. We are an archer through and through. While we may have to pull out a dagger every now and again if we're in close range, for the most part, we are sticking to our bow and arrow, which is why we're going to pick defense. Defense is a passive feature that gives you plus one to your AC. Nice and simple, but certainly useful. And here we've come to the end, level 12, the highest level that you can reach in Baldur's Gate 3. And we're only getting one thing with this level up, but it's really what we showed up for. It's why we're here to take a couple levels of fighter, and that is action surge. Action Surge lets us immediately gain an extra action to use on your turn. It gives you a free action, and if you have extra attack, it means you get two extra attacks. So this is what I was talking about. This is how, by the end of this game, you are going to be making five or maybe even six attacks in a single round. You got a potion of speed, why not eight attacks? You could find yourself surrounded and pick off two, three, maybe even four of your enemies before it is even anyone else's turn to act. Action Surge is an unbelievably good ability, and it's why so many people take a two-level dip in fighter with really any class. Between Second Wind, Fighting Style, and Action Surge, in just those two levels, you get three very useful abilities. So that's it. Levels 1 through 12 of the Gloomstalker Assassin Fighter. I hope you're all excited to create your own. I know I was super excited to build this character when the game launched last month. One more thing before I go though, because as we all know, in D&D, it's more than just your character creation stats that make a build, it's the equipment and the magic items as well. So I just wanna take a quick second to go over some of my favorite items with you. Ones that I thought really helped to define this character. So the first one of these items we'll take a look at is the Shadow of Menzo Berenson. That is this awesome hood and half mask that I'm wearing. Really gives me that cool rogue assassin look. But it doesn't just look cool. This also gives you the ability Shrouded in Shadow, which allows you to become invisible for two turns. Now we already have Umbral Shroud, so this isn't something that we need. But again, it never hurts to have more than one way to do things. Perhaps you've already burned Umbral Shroud and you need the chance to become invisible again. This is always nice to have in your back pocket. I will also mention that Umbral Shroud, you need to be in dim light or darkness to use, whereas this, you don't. You can just use it and become invisible. So it's nice to have both options. It's a very powerful magic item that you can actually pick up pretty early on in the game. This is in Act 1. You can get this from completing the Mykonen quest of killing the Duogar. So if you do that, you will, you will be awarded with this hood. Okay, so another item that you can get in Act 1 is the Disintegrating Nightwalkers. You're going to get these boots from killing Nier, the Drow, at Grimstone in Act 1. Now these are awesome because they give you two different abilities. Now one of them is Misty Step, something that you can already do. So if you wanted to give them to one of your companions so they can 
do Misty Step as well. You're free to do that. I, however, did not, and I recommend holding on to them because the Ranger really has limited spell slots, especially because you're only taking five levels of Ranger, which is only gonna give you two second level spell slots to begin with. So what this does is it allows you to essentially have one free use of Misty Step. And in addition, when wearing these, you can't be in webbed, entangled, or ensnared, and you can't slip on grease or ice. I loved these boots, they were perfect for this character, and the fact that you can get them pretty early on is great. Okay, so for my gloves, I'm wearing the Stalker gloves. These gloves give you a plus three bonus to initiative and also add on 1d4 of force damage to your sneak attack. So absolutely perfect for this build. They can be picked up at the Rivington General Store in Act 3, but until then, there's still some really good choices. Very early on in the game, you can get the Gloves of Power. These give you a plus one bonus to your sleight of hand. Also, creatures you hit with an attack will receive a 1d4 penalty to their attack rolls and saving throws. So these are really solid and you can pick them up right away from defeating the goblins outside of the Druid Grove in Act 1. Also, I did mention the Hail of Thorns gloves. These give you the Hail of Thorns spell. They're also available in Act 1. You can buy them from the merchant in the Mycodin colony. Next, for the armor that I'm wearing here, this is the Penumbral armor. It has a 12 AC, and when you are obscured, the wearer gains a plus 3 bonus to stealth checks. So perfect for this build. It also has the perfect look for this build, in my opinion. And these can be picked up in Act 2 in an abandoned house right next to the Last Light Inn. I'm not really going to go over capes in the game. Um, not that there's no good ones. There are a ton of good capes in the game. None that I would really call build defining for the Gloomstalker Assassin. But there are a ton of good ones. You'll get to the point where you have so many good capes that you don't know which one to wear. There are also several really good longbows in this game. The first one that you will probably pick up is Spell Thief which allows you to regain a level one spell slot when you land a critical hit. This one can be picked up very early on in the Druid Grove. It's sold by the merchant there. Now the bow that will likely replace this is Jolt Shooter. This is a rare longbow that can also be picked up in Act One after you rescue the Grand Duke. It wasn't until I got to Baldur's Gate in Act Three that I replaced it with the very rare longbow, the Deadshot. The Deadshot bow can be picked up from a merchant in Baldur's Gate in the lower city. I love this bow. Anything that increases my chance of a critical hit is fine by me. And that's exactly what this does. It reduces the number for a critical hit by one. This effect can stack. Not only that, but it has an ability called Keen Attack that doubles your proficiency bonus. So that is a monster ability. This is a very powerful weapon. You would be fine to finish off the game with this, however, if you are looking for that legendary longbow, there is one out there. I'm going to try and say it. I believe it's Gonter Male. I don't know. I'm not really sure, but it is a kick-ass legendary longbow that does several things. And this bow can be picked up after you complete the quest to disable the Steel Watch. When you hit an opponent and afflicts them with Guiding Bolt, it doesn't do the Guiding Bolt damage, but it does give the next attack roll advantage on them. The weapon also glows. This is actually one count against using it for this build because this build relies heavily on being in darkness. It also has something called Celestial Haste, which basically gives you haste for five turns without being lethargic. Again, crazy good ability. This is another way that you're gonna increase the amount of times that you can attack in a round. But if that wasn't enough, it has one more. It's called the Bolt of Celestial Light. This frightens your target for two turns, doing 1d8 radiant damage and then additional 1d4 radiant damage on subsequent turns. So this is a powerhouse of a longbow. Unfortunately, you won't get it until you're pretty deep into Act 3, but definitely pick it up because it could aid you well in the endgame. Being that this was my first playthrough, I'm sure that there's items that I missed. Maybe there's some really amazing armor that would just go perfectly with this Gloomstalker build. If so, please let me know in the comments below. I'd love to know what it is and where I can get it so I could pick it up in an additional playthrough. But that about wraps it up, guys. Like I said, I had so much fun with this build. I really highly recommend it. I'm going to be doing a lot more multi-class guides in the future. In fact, I'm going to be doing probably a live stream playthrough 
coming up very soon here where I play a Sorkadin that is a Paladin and a Sorcerer multi-class build. So if you're interested in seeing that and much, much more, please remember to hit that like and subscribe button. It really helps me out. I do appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone, and I will see you next time.